Thank you, brother. It is my great privilege to be with you tonight. Um, I have not been in this building since I was a small child. I don't remember when the last time was, but it would have been in the late 60s, I believe, probably, was the last time I was here. So it's a great privilege to be here tonight and to open the Word of God with you. Turn with me in your Bible, please, to the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to read a passage from Luke, and then we're going to turn over to the Gospel of John as well. Luke chapter 5, the fifth chapter of Luke's Gospel, and I'll read the first 11 verses from that chapter. <clears throat> and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your net for a draught. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing, Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when he had thus done, he enclo they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in other ships, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draught of fishes which they had taken. And Jesus, uh, and, I'm sorry, and so was also James and John, the sons of Debedee, Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Now turn with me over to the Gospel of John and the 21st chapter of John's Gospel. And there again I'll be reading in verse, beginning in verse number 1. The Gospel of John 21 and verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon, Peter, and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana of G in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and the two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. He said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw the net for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fishing, fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and he cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. And Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went and drew the net to land full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty-three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of them durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth to them, and fish likewise. Now this is the third time that Jesus showed himself unto his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, 
He say, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him a third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Let us bow for prayer as we approach God's word this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the book before us tonight is the very verbally inspired word of God. It is inerrant. It was given by the Holy Spirit to inspired men who wrote down the very words that you would have preserved for us this day. We thank you, Lord, that you have not left us without direction. You have given us your word to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. You have not left us to wander in our labors in the gospel without direction. But you have told us to feed your sheep. You have told us to be fishers of men. You have showed us the way you would have us to go. Lord God, I pray that you would make us effective and efficient servants of Jesus Christ. Lord, may you use us for your glory. May you mold your church into that witness and testimony which you would have us to be. And so, Lord, as we approach your word tonight... We pray that you would fulfill your promise, that the Holy Spirit would be our comforter, our guide, and our teacher. And Lord, we pray tonight that the Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth and would reveal Christ to us through the Word. Bless our time together. Lord, it is a privilege to be here. And yet, Father, our gathering together is in vain, except you speak to us through the Word, except we be guided into your truth. And so, Lord, we pray your blessing upon our assembly this evening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Nothing that Christ said or did when he was on earth was without significance. He was constantly teaching his disciples. He was instructing them. In Luke chapter 5, we have the first miracle that Christ did specifically for the education, for the instruction of the disciples. He did not do this miracle before a great multitude. It was just these few disciples, these fishermen. In John 21, we have the last miracle, which Christ did specifically for the disciples, for their instruction. Now, these two miracles are very similar, and yet they're teaching different things. In Luke chapter 5, Christ simply told them to let down the net. But in John 21, Christ told them specifically where to let down the net. Cast the net on the right side of the ship. In Luke chapter 5, the fish are not numbered. It just says there's a great multitude. But in John chapter 1, we're told specifically there was 153 fish that were caught. In Luke chapter 5, the net broke. But in John chapter 21, the net did not break. The context of Luke chapter 5 is that of evangelism. Be fishers of men. From henceforth, Christ says to Peter, you will be a fisher of men. The context of John chapter 21 is that of the church. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And so while these two miracles are similar in that it both involve fishing, there are distinct contrasts between them which go to the very heart of the message Christ was giving to the disciples and that which he desired to teach them. One is the theme of evangelism, ye shall be fishers of men. The other is the theme of the church, feed my sheep. And that's very significant. Because in evangelism, our outreach is to all men. We do not know who God will save. And the net is cast broadly. And yet, we know that God has his own elect people. 
And He knows our names. He knows our numbers. And so in the context of evangelism, we evangelize to all men of all nations. And yet within the context of the church, God knows us individually and specifically. 153 fish specifically named. In the context of uh, evangelism, we will speak with many and we will share the truth of God with many. And some will spring up with joy just like seed along the wayside. Then when trial comes, they wither away. And many times in evangelism, it seems that our net is broken. For we, we speak to people and they show an interest in God's Word and in God's truth. And they seem to, to be very sincere in their desire for God. And then in time, they drift away. And, and in the end, we, they're not to be found. They're not to be numbered among the people of God. And yet in the church we have the security that no man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. And none of us will be lost. And so the net is not broken. We find in John 21 a discouraged bunch of disciples. They've been with Christ for three years. They have seen many miracles. They have seen great work done at the hand of God. And yet their Messiah, the one they looked to, was crucified. He's been re raised from the dead, and they've seen Him now on a couple occasions. That's why it begins in verse 1, after these things, after Christ had appeared to uh, Mary Magdalene in the garden, after Christ had appeared to the disciples without Thomas, and then again with Thomas. After these things, the disciples are all together, and yet they're discouraged. They're downhearted. They have been very faithful. They have been very diligent in the service of their master in the service of Jesus Christ. Peter, of course, has denied, but he's been forgiven. Thomas didn't believe, but he's been forgiven. But we find a discouraged bunch of disciples. And how frequently we become weary in well-doing. Now we're told not to be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And yet we find a discouraged bunch of disciples. Peter says... Well, folks, I'm going fishing. What was Peter's profession? At this point in time, he was a fisher of men, not a fisher of fish. Christ had called him away from the fish. And if you remember back there to the passage you read in Luke chapter 5, Christ said, from henceforth you will be a fisher of men. Not a short time, but from now on, Peter, your, your vocation has been changed. Now you're a fisher of men. You're no longer a fisher of fish. You're a fisher of men. But Peter says, I'm going fishing. He became weary and well-doing. He is turning back to his fish. He does not know what else to do. And so in his discouragement, he's going back to fish. And we find that when Peter looked back to his nets, that others went back with him. And how often it is the case when we're discouraged, rather than encouraging one another, we... Hop on with the discouragement, so to speak. When you're discouraged in your labors for Christ, it's easy to find someone else who will agree with your discouragement rather than bring you out of your discouragement. Peter says, I'm going fishing. And the other disciples say, well, okay, we're going with you. And so they all get into the boat and head out to sea. Peter's commitment was to Christ. But when he wavered in that commitment... Others followed along with him. And that's a lesson to us as well. Because we dare not let our own discouragement in the work of God, we dare not let the day of small beginnings that we're discouraged with discourage others. But rather, we're to look to Christ for our strength. Iron is to sharpen iron. And so the countenance of, of a, a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. And in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, we're told, Let us consider one another to provoke one another to love and to good works. And so we find that they entered into a ship immediately there in verse 3. And there again, when we're discouraged, when we're weary and well-doing, it's always easy to find some way to, to go off on our own way. Now what were the disciples supposed to be doing? Well, they were supposed to be waiting for Christ until they be endued with power. They were supposed to be about the Father's business. But we find them on this night out fishing. Remember when Jonah was running from God? God said to Jonah, Jonah, 
go down to Nineveh. And Jonah ran off the other way. Jonah did not have trouble finding a ship going to Tarshish. It wasn't difficult for him to find. When we become discouraged in the work of the Lord, when we become weary in well-doing, when we pull our hand back from the task that God has given us to do, it's easy to find a wrong path to follow. It's easy to find a wrong way to go. Therefore, as we read in 1 Peter, we must be sober and vigilant because we do have an adversary. His name is the devil. And he's described as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. But on this night, we find these professional fishermen, we find these skilled tradesmen, we find these men who had made their living by fishing, we find them fishing all night and catching nothing. We find that all their labors, apart from what God had told them to do, were fruitless. They caught nothing. In John 15, Christ told the disciples, Abide in me, and I in you. As the vine cannot bear fruit, fruit of itself, let me read the verse to you, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Christ meant it. Without me, ye can do nothing. These professional fishermen who have fished all night caught nothing. And yet we find that Christ was with them even in their discouragement, even in their rebellion, but they didn't recognize him when they see him. I believe that's the reason for the emphasis in verse number one where it's, it is a... Excuse me. <clears throat> or it's a double reference. After these things, Jesus showed himself unto them again at the Sea of, uh, of Tiberias. And on this wise he showed himself. After the resurrection of Christ, he was not recognizable by human perception. Remember the men on the road to Emmaus who walked along with him for many miles and, and didn't know him? Remember Mary Magdalene in the garden who didn't recognize him, though she had spent hours and hours and hours with him? After his resurrection, when he was perceived by his children, by his disciples, it was only because he revealed his identity to them. And so Christ is on the shore. And he calls to these disciples and he says to them, Children, have you any meat? Have you caught anything? How you doing, fellas? I'm sure every one of us have walked up to someone at some time or another who was fishing and said, catching much? Have you caught anything? Now to the fisherman who's, who's pulling in the big ones, that's a great thing to be asked. Yeah, look at this one. Look at this one. Oh, I've got a big one over here. I'm getting so many bites, I'm throwing them back. But when the fisherman's not doing too well, that's not a very pleasant question, is it? No, no, they're just not biting today. Not catching much today. Children, have you any meat? And you know, my friend, when we have strayed from the pathway that God has given us to walk, and when we're not doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing, when we become weary and well-doing, God has to come to us with that gentle rebuke. Children, children. He doesn't call them fools. He doesn't call them rebellious ones. Children, have ye any meat? Oh, what a tender phrase that is. The disciples had gone off on their own way. But children, have you any meat? God graciously shows his children our error in order to direct us back to the right way. Sometimes God has to show us our spiritual poverty to make us hungry for him. Sometimes God has to rebuke us for our failure in study of the word, for our failure in prayer, in order to get us back on track, to get us to back to doing the things that he's given us to do. Children, have ye any meat? 
And then sometimes God has to hide His face from us. Sometimes God has to make us good and hungry. Just like a child who doesn't eat his supper and then he wants candy and he might sit around at night and fuss and fume because mom says you're not getting ice cream until you eat your supper. Sometimes we have to get hungry enough for the Lord that we seek Him. God said in Isaiah 54 verse 8, In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. Children, have you any meat? And so we see, first of all, that our efforts, regardless of what they be, whether they be our physical pursuits or spiritual pursuits or our endeavors to grow as a church, our endeavors to see the Word of God proclaimed, our endeavors in evangelism, if they are not directed by God... And if they are not according to the principles that he has set forth, they are doomed to failure. They are doomed to come up empty. These men were not to be out fishing for fish. They were to be fishing for men. But we see secondly from this passage that when God directs our efforts, they cannot but succeed. When God directs our efforts, failure is not possible. And so... First of all, Christ says to them in verse 6, Cast the net on the right side of the ship. God tells them, Christ tells them what they're to do. And again, consider that these are, are professional fishermen. They knew how to fish. But Christ tells them, cast the net on the right side. He doesn't say, bait a hook. He says, cast the net. He tells them how he wants them to operate. We're told in God's word exactly how we're to operate as the church. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Today, if we, if we look at churches all around us, we find that, that the church, as it's called, has many methods. And you'll hear people say, oh, if we just bring in this kind of music, then we'll get a big crowd. Oh, maybe if we have, have some kind of drama instead of the preaching, will reach more people. Well, if we have parties for the young people, maybe that will attract more people to the church. We can go on and on with all these things that the church is trying to do, and yet God has said, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, reprove rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. God has told us how His church is to be built. And that doesn't mean we can't have a party for the youth group. It doesn't mean there aren't places for some of these other things. And yet, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It all comes back to this book. And this book is the proclamation of Jesus Christ. And if we endeavor by any other means to see the work of God done, we're going to fail. Because we're not doing it by His word. And it's not that He fails, it's that we fail. Because he never fails. And so he tells the disciples to cast the net. God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of Christ. But not only did Christ tell them how to fish, He told them where to fish. Cast the net on the right side of the ship. Right over here, guys. Cast the net on the right side. What's wrong with the left side? Couldn't there be fish on the left side? Christ said, cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. Christ chose the place of their efforts. Remember when Paul and Barnabas... We're getting ready to go on a missionary journey. We read in Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 6. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to uh, Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they passed by Mysia and came to Troas, 
And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia praying him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. They tried three different directions before God finally told them where they were to go. Our labor for the Lord must be directed by God. And our labor for the Lord must be where He leads us. We need to plead with our Heavenly Father for direction. We need to plead with Him that we might know our place. That God might show us where we're to labor and what we're to be doing. They were told to cast the net on the right side. And what is significant about that? It is simply this. The fish were not caught because they were on the right side of the ship. You see, those fish were specifically caught because Christ brought them to the net. They had fished all night and caught nothing. If there were any fish around, just by dumb luck, if you want to put it that way, they'd have to catch one. They'd been casting a net all night long. They'd have to come up with something if there were fish around. But you see, when Christ directed their efforts, and when Christ told them where to let down the net, Christ also brought the fish into the net. We tend to think that our evangelism is our work. God doesn't save a soul because I tell him he's in danger of hell. God saves a soul because God brings that soul to the knowledge that he's in danger of hell. God doesn't save a soul because of what I do. God saves a soul because He ordained before the foundation of the world to save that soul. And so, when we cast the gospel net in evangelism, souls are not saved because we cast the net, but rather souls are saved because Christ said, No man can come unto me except my Father which is in heaven draw him. And so you see, when our evangelistic efforts when our work for the Lord is directed by God and is in the place where God has put us, there will be fruit. Because that is where God's Word does not return void. That is where God's Word prospers in the thing whereunto He sent it, not the thing whereunto I sent it. And so, Christ tells them, cast the net on the right side and ye shall find. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, God says. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. No man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him. All that the Father giveth to me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And we can add many, many, many scriptures to that very theme. One of my favorite verses in all of scripture is this. Isaiah 53 and verse 11. He, that is Jesus Christ, shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Modern evangelism pictures Christ standing around wringing his hands, wondering who will be saved. That's not what we find in the Word of God. Our core theology teaches us that Christ has redeemed to us a people and that they shall be saved. That He is redeemed to us a, a purchased people, a purchased possession, and they shall come to Him. And every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Some will bow in repentance. The others will bow in judgment before our Lord. And so what can we take from this passage tonight? First of all, we may feel abandoned, we may feel very discouraged and very defeated in the work of the Lord. If the disciples could get discouraged and defeated, so can we. Secondly, we are never alone. The disciples were concerned because their Messiah had been crucified, he was risen again, and they could not see him. 
They did not perceive Him except when He desired to be seen of them. And yet He has promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And when the disciples were there on the sea fishing, Christ was on the shore. They didn't recognize Him. They didn't see Him in, his, in their difficulties. And yet, He was there with them all the way. Thirdly, we can learn from this passage that our labor for Christ must be at His command. If our labors for Christ are failing, we need to re-examine them to make sure that we're where God wants us to be and that we're doing things in His way. And then finally, we learn from this passage that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. God's Word will succeed. God will save to Himself a people. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. All that the Father giveth to me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And so may we take this lesson from God's Word. May we take it to our hearts, and may we use it that we might be made effective and efficient servants of the Lord. Shall we stand for prayer before our closing hymn this evening? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your teaching of the disciples, the instruction that you gave to them. We thank you, Lord, that this teaching is applicable to us today. We thank you, Lord, that there are rich instructions for us to learn from your word. Lord, may we heed your instruction. O oh God, make us fishers of men. May we do your work your way. And Lord, we thank you that you will be glorified, that you will save to yourself a people, that those for whom Christ died shall come into the gospel net. The net will not break, and they will be saved. Father, bless your truth to our hearts this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.